Hello and welcome to Spy Hearts Podcast. I'm Agent Scott. And I'm Cam the Provocateur, dodging razor yo-yos like nobody's business. You certainly are, sir. And I, I hear you're all here for a sweet distraction for an hour or two. <laughs> That's right, Scott. And, uh, you know, you reference Octopussy there. And this is actually the 41st anniversary of Octopussy. Uh, true to Spy Hearts spirit. We missed the 40th. But we celebrate the 41st, mm. and I think we have a very special episode today. We do. We have a very special guest. We had the opportunity to sit down with Mr. VJ Amritraj. We'll get into his history in the interview. Tennis pro, legend of the game, and of course, he was VJ in Octopussy. Mm-hmm. And also appeared in Star Trek IV, The Voyage Home, a movie we have a lot of time for as well. Absolutely, yeah. and ironically, involves time travel. But I think before we get to the interview, let's just chat about Octopussy for a second. We've not really spent any time talking about the Roger Moore films here on Spy Hards. And I've got kind of a funny Octopussy anecdote I could share. Please, go nuts. Now, I, I most people listening know my story. I sort of was brought up on the, the Brosnan films. I saw a couple of the other films, and then I went back and did a rewatch when I was later on in life. Uh, but... When I was an early teen, my history teacher had a poster for Octopussy in his office in high school. And I was fascinated with a film that was titled Octopussy. I couldn't get it out of my head for such a long time that it was one I actually tracked down on VHS in, I think, the late 90s to find it and watch it. Because I, was, I couldn't get the idea of a Bond film called Octopussy out of my head. How, like... The giggly 13-year-old Scott was like, oh, it's called Octopussy. <laughs> I, I just couldn't wrap my head around how that got past any censor. You were reading the uh, Ian Fleming novel being like, this is not giving me the tingles I was hoping for. <laughs> <laughs> no, certainly not eight of them. Uh, yeah, it, it, but uh, you know, I, I watched it then and it took me to an all-time high. I think it's one of Roger Moore's sort of, I don't like saying underrated when it comes to Bond films because they're Bond films, but it, it's one that isn't talked about as much as it should. Yeah, for me, Octopussy is kind of like uh, if you were growing up in the Smith family in the 1980s and 90s, Octopussy was where it was at. Because the, I've often said the first Bond film I ever saw was the view was a View to a Kill with my family. But from that point forward, my sister and I wanted to watch more of them. Mm -hmm. And I'm pretty sure I think Octopussy was the second one we ever rented. We were at our family cabin. And we rented it from their video store, which was like 45 minutes away or something like that. And my sister and I just fell in love with that movie. And we ended up like renting it multiple times over the years. You know, I bought the VHS and then the DVD and then the Blu-ray. And it is a movie that is very true to both my sister and I's hearts and one that we never get tired of. No, I rewatched it for this and was entertained the whole way through. And I forgotten how much of a good spy thriller this one is too. I don't think it gets enough props for that. Some of the stuff with the bomb defusal and there's some actual investigative work going on from Bond, which is rare for this era of Roger Moore. It's more mm -hmm. about sort of silly adventures, but he feels like he is a, a spy trying to take someone down. It, 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 I think it also works on that level. Yeah. Oh, 100 percent. Yeah. So I think uh, without further ado, Cam, that's enough of our racket. Let's speak to VJ himself. Cam, serve it up. Joining us today, an actor, producer, sports commentator, and frankly, a tennis legend. During his career, he won numerous singles and doubles titles. He's been inducted into the Tennis Hall of Fame. Oh, and he worked on a James Bond film. It is Mr. VJ Amritraj. Hello, sir. How are you? Scott, lovely to meet you. Thank you. I, I said it off air before, but it's a genuine pleasure. Uh, there aren't many people that cross the Venn diagram of Bond and Star Trek. You are uh, one of the few, and I can't wait to dig into it more with you, to boldly go into your Bond story. Thank you. Thank you very much. Look forward to it. Um, I think the first question, and I'd love to lead us off well, any interview we do with this sort of question, is, is how you got into what we're talking about. So we're going to talk about Bond first, most likely, but you did a little bit of acting before. So how did that acting bug come to you? How did you get started in acting? And why did you get started in acting? Like everyone else, you know, it goes back to something that you grew up with as a, as a child. And uh, what is the first picture that you ever saw when you were old enough to go see one of these, what they called uh, in India, movies only for adults mm -hmm. and uh the movie that i went to see if i remember correctly was uh was dr no 
Oh, wow. So, uh, which came out in 1962. And, uh, you know, ever since then, I looked at this guy who was playing this incredible character from a Fleming book called James Bond. And, uh, you know, he looked everything that a guy wanted to be. And even at the age of, what, 10, 12 years old, 13 years old, playing tennis and trying to get, get out of my health situations, which I had growing up because that's why I got into tennis, as a matter of fact. And uh, I actually looked at this guy who, who did, you know, everything right, so to speak. So it was really it was really interesting that that would be my first major motion picture that I would actually go to a cinema to see and try to get into a cinema when you were not allowed to get in at 12 years old. <laughs> so that's what it was. So I, I, I liked, obviously loved it like everyone else did. And uh, eventually, many, many moons later, playing at Wimbledon, uh, Cubby Broccoli, the late Cubby Broccoli, the genius, and his lovely daughter Barbara watched me play at Wimbledon. And uh, they said, uh, called me over for tea. I ended up having tea with them. And they said, listen, we're getting ready to make this picture. We've looked at over 100, 200 actors for this particular role. And we're looking for Bond's man in India. And we think, you know, you look great. Would you, would you consider doing a screen test? So... Well, I thought to myself, I laughed at it first, of course. And then I said to myself, you know, how many people can say they did Pinewood in the morning and Wimbledon in the afternoon? <laughs> <laughs> so, so so I said, yes. They called me two weeks later and said, we'd like to sign you for 14 weeks. So that's how it all started. Wow. And I was curious, you know, you come obviously from a high level uh, sports background playing tennis. Is there any sort of like element of that that carries over into acting is there something about like the back and forth is there any sort of like discipline that kind of helps with performance i would say uh, two or three very very key um issues one is needless to say you just mentioned that discipline is key mm. you need to have discipline the difference between tennis and and a picture is the fact that uh in a movie there are hundreds maybe thousands of people involved making of one scene yeah. one picture and uh you you work and work and work at it for two three four five days and maybe you get a minute out of it uh, in tennis in the sport that i grew up in that was the biggest difference for me it was you just you you get on the court and it's just you if you're in trouble no one can help you the, you cannot redo it again that's it mm. that's that's as good as it gets nobody to tell you what to do nobody to correct you you know, you can make the world's biggest mistakes, which you can see from the outside, but you don't see it when you're playing. So that is one of the biggest things that you had to get used to when you came on set. Now, when your concentration is what I was able to bring to the set, because there's so much going on on the set when you're doing a scene. And when the director says action and you get into it, you really need that focus. Blind is on, the scene is on, you're aware of the scene, you're aware of the people around you, the co-stars around you, you're playing off of someone else. All these things take incredible focus and discipline. So I think I think there is a, a, a good comparison between the two in that area. Hmm. Did it give you like a confidence? Because you're a newer actor and you were being put in a massive, massive movie. And that could be daunting for a lot of people, especially even like, you know, fully trained actors who've been doing it for a long time. I think the biggest concern for me was I'd never met Roger before the picture. And, uh, you know, it's not like doing it with someone who is not just uh, uh, just an actor, but also a superstar. You know, he'd, he'd already done five of them. Uh, I think Octopussy was a six. And he went on to do View to a Kill after that. He'd done Sea Wolves. He'd done so much. He had such a huge career in film. And one, look at him. And you're looking at James Bond. You know, to be able to take up the mantle of James Bond post Sean Connery and uh, with w one one picture on a Majesty's Secret Service done by George Lazenby, who also became a friend many years later. You, you're you looking at someone that you've admired your whole life and now you're going to work with him as a novice, as a rookie. Mm. And uh, I walked onto the set. They were already been shooting for many, many weeks. Uh, and uh, Barbara took me on the set and... Uh, I stood very quietly in the background looking at the whole scene that they were shooting at Pinewood. And uh, in the middle of the scene that they were shooting, Roger stopped the whole thing and walked straight up to me. 
he walked straight into me and he said, I'm so glad you said yes. We're all absolutely delighted to, to, uh, to be working with you. And we're so happy you said yes to join, join our team. And uh, that, that put me at ease right away. He said, I've watched you play so much. I know what a great champion you are and so on and so forth. He said, made me feel so at home that um, we became instant friends. It made it a lot easier to work with them after that. Right. I mean, stories like that always track. We, we've had your director on this film, John Glenn, on the show in the past, and he did nothing but praise working with Roger and Roger's work ethic and his sort of warmth on set. So just hearing you say that just reinforces it again, because it just seems like the guy you want to work with on the Bond film. He would always make you feel like you're looked after. Yes, and I, and I think, Scott, the other thing also is the fact that he regaled in telling us stories at dinner in the evening. He was magic in storytelling. And he would pick actors and he would pick scenes and he would pick movies and he would pick anecdotes. And his stories were just eye openers. And I could listen and listen and listen. Next thing we knew, four hours had gone. You know, and so he, he was one of those kinds of guys. He made everybody feel comfortable. He stood there in the middle of summer in India with his white dinner jacket on, black tie, cigar in his mouth, just walking around like he was in a swimsuit. Hmm. He was just one of those magicians with the outfits that he wore. And uh, uh, class, just complete class, losing class the whole time. Well, I want to dig into Roger Moore a little bit more, but I want to take us back a bit because you mentioned being sort of picked up at Wimbledon. Carby Broccoli invites you for lunch and you, you sign on to the film. Octopussy itself goes through a very interesting pre-production process because Roger's not there to start off with. You've got names like James Brolin, Sam Neill being thrown around. I'd read somewhere that you had to do a, a sort of a casting process for it or, or play up against someone just for a screen test. Did, was that with Roger or was that with one of the other names involved? How did that go for you? Yes, they actually flew in James Brolin from Los Angeles to come to London to do the screen test with me at Pinewood. Wow. So that particular scene, uh, when he gets off the boat and comes in and, and uh, does that scene with me, was actually done at Pinewood on the stage with James Brolin playing, uh, playing James Bond. So it was interesting that I did the screen test with Brolin. And uh, needless to say, they had not cast Roger yet. At that at that point in time, I think he was also considering, you know, whether five was enough and whether he was still ready to do the next one and commit himself for another year. And uh, I mean, that is a that is a major. This is a major motion picture. It takes forever to get these things done and to get it right. And uh, the stunts that take place and and the um, incredible uh, items that they have. In, in Q's arsenal is is all real. It all actually works. And for all of this to come together with this one, everything centered around this one man they call James Bond, you know, it takes a huge commitment to say yes. And I and I could have I, I, I understood where he was coming from having done five of them prior to Octopus. Now when you were becoming involved in the project and the role of Bond is up in flux, do you have a feeling one way or the other? Because you're obviously a fan for a long time. Are you more hoping to work with like Roger Moore or are you excited about a new Bond or were you just like, I'm just thrilled to be on a Bond film, I don't care? Uh, one and three. I was very, very, <laughs> very, very keen on being in a Bond picture, no question about it. it this is this, you know, literally you're starting at the top of the mountain, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> wondering to myself, where do I go from here? But uh, I really wanted Roger to say yes. That's really what I wanted. And I didn't know the man. Mm -hmm. And then having known him, and then many years later, we would both also uh, get together because he took over from Audrey Hepburn at, as UNICEF ambassador. And I was appointed as a messenger of peace by Kofi Annan for the United Nations. So we ended up doing things together for the UN as well. So uh, just knowing him made that Bond experience so much better. I was actually going to ask you about that, whether on set or the relationship you had there was kind of tied to both of you being so giving to your charitable work. That was something that kind of sparked there, or did that happen more later down the road of knowing him? It did come much later. The movie was shot in 82, 83. It came out in June of 83. As a matter of fact, it came out the week before Wimbledon, which <laughs> was a, a heck of a timing to put it out there. They probably thought of it too at Odeon Leicester Square. 
but the important thing was when many years later he took over from the late Audrey Hepburn to take his, and I couldn't have thought of a better person to take her place. And uh, Kofi Annan appointed me in 2001 as a messenger of peace alongside Muhammad Ali and Luciana Pavarotti, Michael Douglas, the actor, and so on. So it, it gave me a chance to work with him on UN projects as well and meet up with him at various UN events at, at, uh, at New York headquarters as well. Well, synthesizing a couple of things you just said, you mentioned about the sort of dedication that goes into making these films and the commitment it takes, and also it coming out a week before Wimbledon. Now, you're a working tennis pro at this point. You're playing around the world. How did you manage to schedule in doing Octopussy and being a full-time pro tennis player simultaneously? Excellent question, Scott, because one of the things that movie companies do not do is let actors off in the middle of a shoot because obviously anything can happen and insurance covers you when you're there kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So I said, listen, I can't do 14 weeks in a row because I'm not, I can't do it. I can't stay there because I've got commitments all over the world in uh, 1982. And so as it turned out, they made an exception. They allowed me to work for three weeks and go off and play two tournaments and work for two more weeks and go off and play three tournaments. And the storyboard was done in a, matter of speaking, to accommodate me around the big tournaments. So uh, they incredibly wanted me as well as uh, probably as much as I wanted them. And uh, also the important aspect was, I'm sure you've heard about the issues we had with uh, equity in London, with the with Actors' Equity, because I was not a member of SAG mm -hmm. in, in Los Angeles. So um, they actually had to make a move and have a discussion with equity, which I think apparently Cubby and and, uh, and uh, John Glenn and Roger all had spoken to in front of a in front of a committee and say how important it was for Cubby to have freedom to cast the person he wants. Uh, otherwise we never would have had someone like Odd Job and Goldfinger mm. and so on and so forth. So he made some really good points. And then he sent me to Los Angeles to do a um, guest appearance on um, Fantasy Island, so that I could get my side card, and uh, which is exactly what I did, and uh, and came back, and uh, obviously being a member of SAG, and then got on to do the picture, and sign sign on to do the picture. But it was so well orchestrated to be able to allow me to go play tournaments in between. Hmm. And I noticed, you know, I was rewatching the movie last night. Like your scenes are pretty split between location work and then work on like Pinewood and locations like that. I was just curious, is that kind of how they worked around your schedule was to just separate those two things and have you in two different locations? Well, they were going to be on location in India for three weeks. Mm -hmm. And uh, the middle week, I got caught with the Davis Cup match in Russia in, in the old Soviet Union at the time. Mm -hmm. So I said to them, I can do week one and week three, but I can't do week two. And uh, so they worked my storyboard around to give me week one and week three. And then I went off to, to Donetsk, actually, which strangely is now obviously in the Ukraine mm -hmm. at the moment and having all these issues that are going on at the moment. But I did play in Donetsk, which was the old Soviet Union at the time, and then came back with uh, some caviar and, uh, and Russian champagne <laughs> for the third week, put it out for the crew and Roger and had this banner up that said from Russia with love. Oh. So I, it went down really well in the third week. Wow. I, only in the Bond films could they make that happen for you and then that happened <laughs> yeah. afterwards as well with the banner. That's... I mean, that is... I mean, it's crazy to think that you managed to also, you know, you're doing these on location shoots in India, taxing days, long shoots where you're standing around waiting for your two minutes of shooting and then waiting for another hour while they set up the next shot. But you're keeping your fitness up at the same time because you're still doing all that. How are you getting that all in at the same time as shooting? So when we were had a call time of um, 7 a.m., 8 a.m. on set in, uh, in Udaipur when we were getting ready to shoot, and Roger would be up at uh, five o'clock and make up already and sitting by the pool and getting his makeup done because they were hot days. Mm. And uh, I would be off on my five mile run in the morning and uh, get my, get my, uh, uh, my breathing going to a point where I could last out 
three days of long Davis Cup matches. Needless to say, we were going to play um, in in Donetsk, which was a completely different atmosphere at the time against uh, the Soviets. But the interesting thing was that in between that, in the early mornings and late evenings, where I would go off and hit, hit with the local pro for an hour, hour and a half before dinner, depending on what the timing was on my boarding of the shoot. Mm. So I, I, I kind of tried to fit not the best way to prepare for tennis matches, but uh, it's the best I could under the circumstances and accommodate both. But the big point for me was to be able to play Davis Cup for my country and at the same time do a Bond picture. was I, It'll be tough to be repeated. I don't think 82 gets much better, does it? <laughs> it does not. It was awesome. <laughs> It was awesome. Well, I wanted to get to the movie itself. And let's just start with your character's introduction. And you have the kind of the snake charming scene. And I've read stories that like you weren't necessarily a big fan of snakes, which uh, I can relate to. I would be very feeling very similar in your uh, shoes there. But I'd read a quote from John Glenn saying that to kind of help with this, they had basically put you through almost like snake training in a sense. And I was just wondering if you could talk about that experience of... Kind of what went into dealing with the snake? Well, well, first of all, in my screen test, they said, uh, this is what the screen test is going to look like when they brought out the pages. Yeah. And I said, oh, you want me to work with a cobra? <laughs> and they said, have you ever worked with a snake before? <laughs> I said, no, I've played against some guys on the court who were a little tricky, but that's as <laughs> far as you You know, but on the other hand, I, how long will it take for you to get used to a snake? I said, is that a serious question? Is that actually a serious question to ask me? I said, guess what? I'll get to the set. Don't show me the snake. Don't show me the snake charmer. Just bring the snake out. And let's hope that my concentration and my adrenaline will get me through working with this thing. Okay? That's what I'm going to do in this print test. So they said, okay. <laughs> and they allowed me fine. We've never seen the snake before. And the guy brings it out. I tell the snake charmer, I said, listen, I guess you've taken all the poison out. And uh, he said, uh, 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 no, Mr. Amitraj, um, got to leave a little bit in there. <laughs> otherwise, the snake dies. So I said, what happens if it, you know, yeah. has a bit of a go at me? It's a chance. Yes. Yes. We wouldn't, we wouldn't like that very much. So I said, are you kidding me? The snake still has some poison in it? He said, oh, yes, it does. And, uh, uh, you know, everybody took it as a matter of course. Part of the actor's job. Oh, insurance covers it, don't worry. <laughs> so we went forward with the whole thing. And strangely enough, the, the snake behaved pretty well. I mean, the snake charmer wasn't far away, but he was out of shot. And uh, especially when we were on location in, uh, in Udaipur, the thing kept moving everywhere out of the basket, you know, in, in the opening stage. But... Uh, the thing that amazed me was how cool Roger was under the circumstances. You know, mm. I suppose if it was a tiger, if it was a snake, if it was an elephant, if it was whatever else it was, he was just James Bond. You know, and that gives you gives you that adrenaline to also uh, feed off of. That uh, made me more comfortable. And he worked with a lot of animals in that movie as well. Like Octopussy, among all the Bond films, probably has the most variety. So, yeah, Roger Moore was, uh, I guess, uh, nerves of steel by the end there. Um, I was going to ask, too, just in regards to that scene, there's, of course, the famous little in-joke where your character plays the Bond theme. Was that something that you had a sense of shooting it, or was that like a discovery when you saw the movie in the theater? No, no, we knew that it was coming, obviously. Pretty much most of it was coming. I, my name was different when, we, when they wrote the script. Hmm. But uh, Roger said, why don't, I, why don't I just call him BJ? It's just much easier for me to do it. And so... All of a sudden, my name changed back to what it was supposed to be in the first place, <laughs> I think, for, for Roger's comfort level, which uh, he said, obviously, comfortably. But the, uh, the, the the theme itself is such an iconic theme that uh, playing it on a flute, making it look like I was playing it on a flute to a great extent for that particular scene made it that much more fun mm. and cheery and something that uh, Bond would recognize as he gets off the boat. You know, so it made it made a lot of sense with this cobra in front of me that uh, I just thought it played really well. 
It's, it's a great little joke. And you don't get many times where they nod to the theme and Bond hears the theme. I think it might be the only time, maybe second time he hears the theme in the whole run. Maybe. You could let us know, folks listening. But I, speaking of the VJ character, I noticed there's some uh, subtle tennis cues in there and some nods <laughs> to your uh, profession. Uh, were they in there when you were pitched the character or was that something that was added in when you signed on? No, they added it in. And if I'm, if I'm not wrong, but Roger did most of that. You know where he kind of threw in, you know, my backhand's improved, and uh, you know he's a tennis pro at Kamal's club, and you know some there, there are lots of other choices to work with. Mm. As a matter of fact, so I uh, with a racket in hand, and I I got it with the racket and hitting the grenade back, stuff like that. There were lots of other options that they worked with before they finally came out with the uh, with that chase sequence through the streets of Udaipur, which was just incredibly hard to get done. But uh, it took something like three days to do that that one scene, mm. and uh, with the I think they had like a couple of thousand extras in that particular scene and positioned so well, and you got these vehicles moving at a you know not exactly slowly; they're moving fairly quickly, and uh, you've got cameras mounted, you've got the action sequence going, you've got the cop in the middle, you've got it. It was it was a very hard scene, and the, the stuntman actually hurt himself very badly in one of the in one of those fight sequences and uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know it, it, you you wonder how these things get done and you have the greatest admiration and respect for both the actor as well as the stunt people who put these scenes together uh, you know and it all has to come together and you might have to do it more than once or twice three or four five times so it's it, it's a it, it 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 really has to come together with as many cameras as you can otherwise you're really not going to be able to get what you want and it's a tribute too to Octopussy and that that is a very kind of like light, fun movie of, you know, the various Bonds have different tones depending on the movie you're watching. And that one is just like almost like an Indiana Jones, like just romp. It's so much fun beginning to end. And that speaks to the how incredible the stunt people were, because it's a lot of hard work and it looks so light and fun when you see the movie. Yes, I mean, it, it's, it's very, very hard to make a Bond picture for simple reasons, because First of all, the expectations are high, right? Mm. I mean, everyone is everyone is expecting, you know, when they did Spy Who Loved Me, uh, I think with uh, with Barbara Bach, you know, it was it was uh, it's Bond and Beyond, you know, and, and and you're always looking at something that's taking you to the next stage. You got not not only to beat the previous one you did, but you now also have to beat everyone else that's in the marketplace. Mm. So it's a it's it's a hard act to follow your yourself. So in this particular one, the opening scene with the with the little plane that that flies through the hangar, you know, uh, apparently they only did it twice, and it just you know he nicked he nicked the hangar on one of the goes, I think. Uh, and you know those are real; those things actually work. And that auto rickshaw that I drove was not actually a local one; it was done with incredible amount of horsepower, so it would come up and. It took me a couple of days to get to drive the thing. So when you look at these things, and, and uh, not only to make it you know, out of this world, but also humorous and also energetic and also action-oriented with adventure and some snide remarks that Bond can make off the cuff, it's not easy. And it, it really comes down to that, to that quarterback, as we say in the U.S., you know, with John Glenn at the helm. Mm, yeah, you, you've led me in VJ to my next question, which is John Glenn. As I said, we've had him on the show. We've spoken about Octopussy with him before. For your experience, this is your first big film. He's your first big director. How was it like working with John? Well, again, you know, uh, certainly in my humble opinion, uh, the director needs to have a great sense of personality and humor. Mm. You need to be able to get along with people more than anyone else, and. And uh, John was very good at that. He he was a nice man. He knew what he was doing. He knew what he wanted. You know, he had the coverages that he needed. He he had a tremendous team around him, obviously, with the Bond team. Uh, these guys are, you know, 10 Roger Federer's playing a tennis match. You know, it's, it, it is just uh, the best at everything from the writers to the magicians to the stunt guys to the camera guys to the grips to the gophers everyone knew their place and they they did if they needed one hour to do it it was done in 55 minutes you know and so 
John was dealing with a fantastic team, and uh, as leader of that team, he had he had what he wanted and was able to pull it together. But still, you know, when a, when you're making a Bond movie, things could go so horribly wrong when you put these pieces together, and the stunt guys have to be spot on each and every time, and the camera guy has to be able to cover it. And an aspect of your character and that kind of ties into the Tuk Tuk chase is that VJ is smiling through so much of that chase. And I remember, you know, Octopussy was in my family growing up, the big Bond film. That was the one we watched the most. It's one of my sister's all time favorite movies. Um, she has the poster on her wall as we speak. And um, VJ, I think, brings such a like a lightness to that movie that is infectious. And I always felt like as I've kind of grown up watching Octopussy over the years, and you know, seeing it so many times since, he's almost like an avatar for Bond fans. It's one of the first characters where I felt as a kid watching it that it was someone who realized how cool it was to be in a James Bond film, and it works through the character. You know, you're, it doesn't feel like you're breaking character. It's just like an infectious quality, yeah. and that makes your death scene that much more tragic because it is one of the darkest death scenes in all the Bond films. But <laughs> was that something that like? Was that like a decision? Was there just an enthusiasm about making the movie? Like, where did that kind of come in finding VJ as a character? I think it really came from Cubby to a great extent, because the first thing he said to me was, uh, I said, Cubby, I I've never done any acting, so I should really go to some acting lesson. And he said, don't. Mm. He said, we need your originality in this. Your originality, the way you are and the way you speak and the way you are able to communicate with people is what the character needs. So you, I want you to be yourself mm. and come out there with that originality and do what comes naturally to you. And so it was an enjoyment of being on a movie like this, number one. Number two, you're working with arguably one of the biggest stars in Hollywood uh, and in movies, in motion pictures. And more than anything else, you're helping him beat the bad guys and the bad guys are chasing you and falling flat on their face. Now, that's an enjoyment from within that comes out. And I think you can see that when I say game, set, and match, when the guy actually, uh, uh, the character actually pulls up the uh, the tuk-tuk and it kind of does the does the turn and gets, gets rid of those guys behind you, having had that fight sequence. So I think all those things were were in you when you when you were in the middle of that scene, and I think it came off quite nicely. There has to also be like a satisfaction in knowing when you're shooting a Bond film that this is going to be remembered, and I'm sure there's some nerves that come with that. But no matter what, like you know that this movie is going to be something that will continue to have a life. Yes, no question. This is for keeps. This isn't going anywhere, and it's going to be in the history books. And that uh, the tuk tuk that I drove is in the Bond Museum over here in Los Angeles. And I think all of that is in your head. It's in your DNA now. You're you're in it forever. You're a Bond actor forever. Yeah. And uh, they've written books about it. They they tell stories about not just the movie, but the entire group of pictures that you're clubbed in with. And so, I think all of that is in you when you do this. So you are hoping and praying that the way that you are performing is not just your best, but it's also good enough for the picture that you're a part of now and history that you will be a part of. So I think all of these things do do matter and it mattered to me more than, more than anyone else. And I'm sure a lot of people coming in to Bond pictures for the first time, playing a Bond girl in, in, a, in a picture was a huge thing at the time. And uh, I think the, the characters have changed over a period of, period of uh, 50 years. But uh, for me, it was such a special moment in time, not just in my uh, film career, but certainly in, just in my life altogether. Yeah, you mentioned the, the history of the Bond films, and I think of like the legend of Bond. And that's for you personally a thing too. You had that going to see Dr. No, and it carried to the time you started making Octopussy. You got on set, Roger Moore ran across and embraced you and said, welcome and we're glad you're here. Looking back on making Octopussy, what is your sort of favorite story, your favorite moment from putting that film together? Well, there are so many, but I would have to uh, go back to the dinner uh, times in Udaipur, sitting by the poolside with um, the entire cast of it at a big, a big long table with Roger sitting at the head of the table and a 
in a beige safari suit and uh, loafers on, a cigar in his mouth, having dinner in a very, very hot summer evening with Louis and his wife and uh, uh, Roger and his wife and and uh, Maud and Kabir and all the uh, all the actors seated at the table and uh, him telling stories of a variety of movies. And every anecdote that he told had an incredible punchline that he delivered with a straight face. And he'd be in the middle of the longest stories and uh, he would suddenly get up and uh, we were by the pool, right by the pool, suddenly get up and he'd put a cigar down by the poolside and dive right in hmm. and then swim up to the very end, swim back out, put the cigar back in his mouth and continue with the story like nothing happened. <laughs> and uh, the first time he did it uh, was was. I didn't know what to think. Was this meant to be a joke? Is he trying to cool off? But he's got his clothes and shoes on. He goes in and out. And he, he th that was him. That was that was what Roger was. And and I will never forget that moment because he, I, I just it just blew my mind. I, I, I love things like that on the spur of the moment. Mm. And that's me. I love doing that, surprising people. And he did it just without even a cut of a smile. And he just did it as part of the story. And those kind of anecdotes, I think, are hard to come by. We interrupt this program to bring you a special report. Red Alert Spy Hards, we are shaking things up over on the Patreon page. That's right, we are launching an exclusive new show where we tackle the exploits of the small screen's greatest secret agents, like Jack Bauer, George Smiley, and beyond. And don't forget, every month you also get two Agents in the Field episodes where we decode the adventures of your favorite spy actors in their biggest non-spy movies. But Cab, tell the people what we have coming up next. May was one hell of a month over on the Patreon. We reviewed Pulp Fiction and The Return of the Pink Panther and also the 2008 TV movie 24, Redemption. The hits, they just keep on rolling, Scott. So don't get left out in the cold. Help support your favorite spy movie podcast and join the circus at patreon.com slash spyhards. But before this message self-destructs, let's get back to the spy jinx. We've talked a lot about, you know, Roger Moore and John Glenn, but there's another collaborator on this film that's very important to your scenes, which is Desmond Llewellyn. And you have like the kind of the rare treat as a Bond ally character to not only visit Q Branch, but get to share extended scenes with Desmond Llewellyn. If you could just talk a little bit about that experience. I tell you, I don't know if anyone could have been cast better than Desmond was in that particular role as Q. Mm -hmm. He was just, he, I forgot his name. He was Q. <laughs> you know, it didn't matter what he said. I, I was trying, I had to, when I called him by name, I had to remember to call him Desmond right? rather than saying, Q, where is this? Or Q, where is that? You know, and uh, he was older by the time he did uh, Octopussy, but he was spectacular. He was so immersed in, in being Q that I think it was very easy to come up with uh, comedic lines also between Roger and Q as the movies progressed. And uh, he started off seriously with Sean and, and needless to say, when he started to get into the Roger movies, uh, all the way from Live and Let Die, I think, there were more more of those one-liners that came in uh, on a frequent basis. And uh, they had a relationship that was quite special, Q and, uh, Q and James Bond. And needless to say, along with uh, Bernard Lee when he first, first played Ed. Mm. And I have to ask, just as a you know, one Bond fan to another, what is it like to see the inner workings of Q's workshop in person? To see, you know, you get to witness like the rope, uh, the climbing rope, uh, you know, gadget. You get to see like the spike door. What is it like to actually witness those things on a set? I think the thing that amazed me, and it continues to amaze me, is that everything worked. Everything was what it was meant to be. Right. It was not a dummy. It was not. You know, it was not just done for the picture. It actually worked from that plane to all the way down into Q's workshop. 
everything worked. And it's it was mind boggling to me that uh, these things could happen, you know. And and Q has to know about each and every one of them. Mm-hmm. But, you know, even that pen, that little pen we took off the top and stuck it in his ear and be able to listen. It, I think that was the one that truly surprised me. I really thought a lot of them were going to be dummies and they were going to be used and you know you can massage it in a in a in a scene but uh not in q's workshop they wanted it that way and and uh eon and cubby and barbara michael always got it right wow uh cam mentioned your death scene something that hurts bond fans worldwide because no one wants to see you leave the film just as as a question for you uh, vj when you're visiting beaches going forward are you always on the lookout for yo-yo chainsaws now because they could come out of nowhere yeah, Kamir and I caught up with Maud. Maud came to India on a visit, and uh, we had a lovely picture taken of the three of us in uh, in Mumbai. And we we caught up with Kabir to come over for dinner, which he did. And uh, we were talking about all of that, mm. and it was it was really really fun to revisit it. And uh, going back to that particular scene, I asked the guy up there when he's about to throw this yo-yo down at me. I said, uh, you know. How long have you been practicing it? And he said, "I only got it this morning." <laughs> and uh, <laughs> so uh, Roger made a comment from the other side of the room, uh, which I can't remark in your podcast. But uh, <laughs> it, it, I can guarantee you, it meant a lot to me what he said, and I was very careful. But uh, he, he, but it was amazing. He had to only miss me by this much for him to be for it for him to for it to look like what it was meant to be, and they cut it off to the words. But I think that particular unit was a very heavy unit mm. that revolved both ways. <laughs> I've never seen anything like it. And I said, "What is? how do you come up with these thoughts of <laughs> killing someone? I mean, put a bullet through his head, for Christ's sake, you know? Who has that twisted mind? <laughs> yes, exactly, <laughs> exactly. But... You know what? It it played incredibly well because it set the scene mm. for the time when he was uh, over the bed with uh, Roger and Maud in that particular that sequence of killing that guy with a yo-yo. It really does. And as a kid, I remember being absolutely like horrified at the death of VJ. And it's because that character is so fun to be around that when that happens, you really it, it sticks with you. And in a way, it may be a very grim fate, but it's a perfect one because I think every Bond fan remembers that moment. Yes, and I also think it showed up in a lot of game shows. How did this guy die? <laughs> you know, ah. Was it A, B, C, or D? You know, <laughs> and uh, uh, obviously, I mean, it, it's easy. There are lots of those things that came up afterwards. The cravat that I wore when I came into the club, and uh, where is that cravat from? You know, that was on, um, I think, on one of your British game shows. Uh, can't remember whether it was Countdown or one of those shows in the in the UK, and uh, it was a cravat from the International Club. Hmm. I see, uh, I see of Great Britain, and that it's a very famous club. It's clubs all over the all over the world, and that was what that represented. So there were lots of these things that came up after the movie, and and because it was such an iconic film, and had tennis touch to it, that uh, they were able to do that. So it played out really well. Final octopusy question for me before I move us on to Star Trek: uh, the filming of a Bond film is not where it ends. It continues for years and years, but one thing that happens is the premiere, and you mentioned that, and that's a very important thing. I watched a video of you at the premiere today with a very nice outfit with some bespoke buttons on your top. It was a pretty well put together outfit. You look great. Um, What was it like going to the royal premiere? I think you had a long chat with a certain royal who's no longer with us. What was that whole process like? Well, again, when they said it's black tie, I requested that I wear an Indian outfit. Mm -hmm. So they had to go back to Buckingham Palace to find out if that was allowed wow. for this particular scene, for the opening with uh, their Royal Highnesses uh, at the time, uh, HRH Prince of Wales and Princess of Wales. And uh, they came back and said a resounding yes. And so that was the outfit I wore for my wedding when I got married. And it had been, I had gotten married in, on, in January of 83. Right. And the picture came out in June of 83. So my bride, my new wife was in the, in the theater when I was when I was uh, outside for the introduction, and as uh, you know, the then His Royal Highness Prince Charles walked by, and he said a few nice things, and he seemed to know everything about everybody. I was just thinking to myself at that time, 
I remember thinking to myself, my goodness, he is so fit to be king. And uh, and then uh, the Royal Highness comes along, uh, Princess Diana, and uh, she obviously looked stunning in the outfit that she was wearing. Mm -hmm. There are two cameras, one behind her and one behind me. And she stopped over and started a conversation because they had told us that we don't speak unless we're spoken to first. Mm -hmm. And she said uh, something to the effect of my tennis, that she'd seen me play at Wimbledon and it was wonderful, you look great. And it was more of a statement than I wanted to say something. And uh, we ended up having a wonderful conversation. And then she said to me, you know, where do you... Where did you get those buttons? And she started to look at my buttons, <laughs> which you just said. <laughs> and uh, it was a, it was the most amazing opening of a, of anything that I'd been to with uh, with the two of them. And uh, uh, they were both quite stunning in in what the way they were, the way they were, and to uh, to see. I ended up many years later with my with my wife, actually being invited to dinner at. Uh, James Palace with uh, the then Prince Charles, and we had a wonderful conversation with him, and it it was quite spectacular. Now to see him on the throne is quite special, obviously, but uh, it was one of those moments that you cherish forever, mm. and to have those meetings, to have those moments in time that just they just stand out fresh in memory, and I hope and pray they never ever go away. Captured in perpetuity, now they're in video form. And, and there to revisit. But you mentioned time and uh, we're running out of it. So we need to warp speed to uh, another <laughs> franchise. And that is Star Trek, uh, a franchise very near and dear to Cam and I's heart. You're, of course, in Star Trek for, albeit briefly, but I'd like to know how you got involved with Star Trek in the first place, a couple of years later after Octopussy. So uh, I knew a gentleman by the name of Harv Bennett, yeah. who was... Uh, the producer of these of the pictures and uh he was a huge tennis fan as well I played tennis at his home in los angeles and he said listen we're getting ready to do this picture and you know we're going to come to you to you know play one of the big characters and so on and so forth and i was beside myself because obviously we all grew up with star trek again and i would actually try to videotape with a movie camera super 8 movie camera off the television the old star trek with the with Kirk and Spock uh, way back when and take it back to India and try to watch it on spools. Mm. Oh, so wow. I was very, very close to both Bond and Star Trek growing up. And that's the one hour show that I watched without missing it when I was first in, first in the United States. And as it turned out, when they were getting ready to shoot the picture, they got hold of my agent and said, uh, we'd like him to uh, come and test for being on the bridge. And, uh, Unfortunately, what happened was that when I got the offer to do one of the bigger roles in the picture, it came at the same time as playing Queen's Club in Wimbledon mm. oh. that year. And I remember having an argument, very strong argument, with my then agent who's since passed away, bless his soul. Jack and I had this argument where he wanted me to play Wimbledon and I wanted to do Star Trek. <laughs> Right. Which should have been the other way around, you know. But it didn't. I ended up, this was 85, I think it was, or 80, I can't remember, 85, I think it was. Yeah. And uh, I ended up playing Wimbledon because he said you can always do movies, but you can't play Wimbledon all the time. So I ended up having a very good year at Wimbledon. As a matter of fact, I beat Yannick Noah there uh, on the center court at Wimbledon, which was a big win. But when they came back, Harv still, still wanted me in the picture. So he said, listen, there is this role for the captain of the USS Yorktown. Uh, would you, it's a small role, but we'd love for you to be in it. And I said, fantastic. I would love to do it. And uh, I accepted doing the piece, <laughs> and, which is another interesting story because when I went off to do my fitting and I was wearing this captain's outfit, and you can well imagine someone growing up with Star Trek and seeing Kirk and Spark and all of this, and you're wearing this captain's outfit i mean you, you tend to lose it a bit you know i mean this and then when i got to the set itself and i'm sitting at paramount in the captain's chair huh. to do the piece as captain randolph uh, 
you know, the crew is behind me and I'm sitting in the captain's chair. And it, it's all an enterprise. And I, I'm, I'm, I'm losing it <laughs> because I was so excited. I couldn't, couldn't stop myself. And there they are having a story conference in a, out there about, I don't know, 30, 40 feet away was um, Harv and, and uh, Nimoy and, and Shatner. And uh, suddenly, Leonard sees me losing it in the seat. And he walks across all the way to me. Pin drop silence now. Leonard Nimoy walks across. He's a director of the picture, by the way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And he comes and he puts his arms, leans into me, puts his arms on the armrest. And now I'm going back and I'm going, and I'm still laughing, you know, at the whole incredible scenario here. And he looks at me and he says, This is a captain's uniform, and this is a captain's chair. Don't mess with it. Wow. <laughs> and he was so serious, you know, and he was he was being actually deadly serious because they were they were Spock and Kirk. They were both living. I think when they went home, they were still Kirk and Spock. You know, <laughs> they couldn't they couldn't get out of that incredible, incredible um, characters that they had created. They were both so brilliant in what they did. And and Nemo, I directed that picture perfectly. I mean I thought Wonderful film. I thought that was arguably the best of the of the Star Trek pictures about the whales and so on. It, it was just a, the most wonderful feeling to be a part of that. Incredible. Really is a perfect scenario where you do this guest spot in the film, basically, this small role, but then you wind up in, as you said, like one of the big, it was like the biggest hit Star Trek movie at that time for a long time, and it's a beloved movie as well. Yeah. In both cases, you know, your kind of entry into these worlds that you loved turned out really, really well. Yes, uh, Cam, it, it, very hard to dream these things up. It's very hard to have these even dreams as children growing up. You know, you can watch movies, you can watch Undercoated Wimbledon, you can you can eventually see things because television comes into your home at some point in time. It didn't when I was growing up. And uh, you imagine doing these things for the United Nations to, to be on a broadcast booth doing television and so on and so forth. It, you, 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 honestly... You couldn't even dream them up. Mm -hmm. And then to be able to live it through a time when you understand everything and you know everything and you know the importance mm -hmm. of where it came from is nothing but a, but a blessing from above. And uh, what my parents created with me was, uh, was a life that I never dreamt I would because they were two ordinary people doing extraordinary things. I just to sort of wrap us up on, I think, the films, because we're, we're running short on time. I, I did want to ask, looking back on Octopussy and Star Trek, two of these big franchises that both mean a lot to you, did you keep any mementos from those shoots? Did you perhaps have a captain's uniform sitting in your cupboard or a circular saw somewhere? So from the Bond picture, yes. I had a couple of things which was, which was great, even from, the, even from the outfits and so on. Mm. So when I was finishing up with Star Trek, I said to... Uh, can I, I said to the um, uh, to the producers, uh, "May I take the outfit?" And they said, "No." Oh. So I said, uh, "Came back the next day and I said, uh, may I buy the outfit?" And they said, "No." So I came back the next day and tried to steal it, and I still couldn't <laughs> get it. <laughs> I guess it belongs. I guess it belongs in the museum, but uh, the best piece I have is a picture of me as the captain of the USS Yorktown. I, I need to see that picture you've got at some point. Uh, there, there needs to be more images of you in that captain's chair. There's not many online. We need some high quality images of, uh, of uh, Captain Randolph there. To close us out, moving on from films, you've kept tennis in your blood. I mentioned, you know, sports commentary, your family, you know, are sports t tennis pros now. It's it's in your blood tennis. You've still worked with tennis. You work in commentary, but you've also stuck to films in a producer's role. You've been producing films ever since. You're working on films now from what I've read online. Could you tell us what you've got coming up and what you're working on? We're working on two great pictures at the moment. One is a rom-com and one is an action-adventure. And uh, Prakash, my son, who you probably see on Tennis Channel, mm -hmm. he's the face of the Tennis Channel in the United States. He just came back from... Monte Carlo doing the Monte Carlo Masters. He goes back to Madrid this weekend to the Madrid Roman, the French Open. And I'll be at Wimbledon doing Wimbledon again. Uh, 
this is, <laughs> believe it or not, my 54th Wimbledon with a one-year break for COVID. Wow. But uh, <laughs> it's interesting because uh, you get to meet some of the most fascinating people at the championships, which is the greatest tournament in the world, by the way. So, yes, we're working on several movies, but these are the ones that are on the forefront at the moment. Mm -hmm. And we're hoping that uh, the rom-com would go into potentially a shoot this year, later this year, and then the action piece, adventure piece, which is an original one, which is really well written, I think. And uh, uh, when, once we make the announcement, I'm hoping we'll be able to do it in the next few months, that that will go into production in the first quarter of next year. That's that's the hope. So I think we've got, got some really good stuff in the bag and uh, learned a lot over the years, and I'm really looking forward to these pictures. I was just going to ask, would you ever consider like returning to acting? Because it's been a while since you've done it. Um, uh, uh, hopefully, I will be in the second one okay. of what we're doing as well. Again, in a in a role that suits that particular particular scene. Sure. That I would I would work that would work for. Otherwise, I certainly wouldn't do it. And there are one or two others that have come up as well, where there are particular roles that. Um, I would consider looking at because it, 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 it fits me where I am today in my life. And uh, as the great Charlton Heston once said that to me, you know, to pick the role that suits your age and time in your life. So <laughs> I try to try to follow that pattern as we move forward. So hopefully that will come true. Awesome. Well, Vijay, the final question I have for you, and we've asked this to every single guest we've ever had on the show, all the way back to some of your co-stars on Octopussy. Vijay, what is your favorite spy movie of all time? You mean second after Bond? You can include the Bond films, but if, if that's your favorite, that one of the Bond films, if you can pick one, that is. But what, of all time, all the Bond, all the spy films collectively. If if Bond is your favorite, pick one, and that, that'll be fine. Well, goodness gracious, that's a very broad question. Isn't I know it? it's a horrible <laughs> curveball to finish on, but we always like to just catch people out. It's a very very horrible curveball but uh you know listen there are a variety of ways to look at this mm. question and i don't mean to lengthen out the answer for you but uh, uh, uh let me say that it's like saying which is the best comedy it's like saying which is the best action picture you've done or is it indiana jones or is it uh you know it's in the line of fire whatever it whatever else you might look at but i think when you look at bond from where it started with sean and the way ian wrote it with the first 13 books and what Cubby and Harry did in the beginning, and then what Cubby continued to do incredibly well, incredibly well, and casting people that never would have got a chance to be in a picture. And then what Barbara and Michael have taken with that legacy and taken it even to further heights to where they are and where Daniel has left us on these particular 50, 60 years of pictures, mm -hmm. picture making in 26 and going into the 27th. It's hard to compete with that legacy of that many pictures done at such an incredible level of movie making. Mm. And to keep not just the action adventure bit, but to keep the spy bit and to keep the thriller bit and change with the times, but without changing at all. This is what I would compare it to Wimbledon because Wimbledon has changed over the times, but it really hasn't changed if you look at, look at the building and look at the center court. So I think you want to be able to do that and say the next generation of moviegoers will look at a Bond picture and say, oh my goodness, I can't wait for the next Bond picture to come out. And that's why I feel the legacy of Bond will always be my favorite spy film, my favorite thriller film, my favorite action adventure picture, and my favorite character that has truly, truly stood the test of time. If I was gonna twist your arm, could you pick a specific Bond film? Uh, you'd have to go back to the first time. Mm -hmm. You'd have to go back all the way to Dr. No. And when he looked at it and when, when she looked at him and she said, and you have a great deal of luck. And she says, and you have a great deal of courage. And he says, my name is Bond, James Bond. You'd never know that that particular line is going to stay in movie making forever. So I would have to go back to Dr. No. Great pick. I can't, can't fault it. Wonderful pick. And it brings us back to the beginning again. Beautiful symmetry there. VJ, it's been a genuine pleasure from, from Cam and I, and I'm sure the many, many listeners listening to hear from your stories about Octopussy and your career. Thank you so much for sharing this hour with us. It's been a genuine pleasure. 
Thank you, Scott. Thank you, Cam. You guys do a great job, and I'm glad we could get together. Really fun. Thank you. Awesome. There you go, folks. That was our chat with Mr. VJ Amritraj. I hope it took you to an all-time high. Yeah, no kidding. This was an absolute joy and one of the more surreal interviews for me because it's someone who was such a such a big part of my childhood. Like, as I said, Octopussy was a movie that my sister and I just obsessed over and mm. I've watched VJ on screen <laughs> live and die so many times that it was kind of bizarre to sit there and hear these stories, you know, firsthand from him talking about shooting the movie and the experience of promoting it, all of that sort of stuff. It was it was a trip. You know, you mentioned the sort of infectious joy that VJ has in the film. What well, people listening to this, and not necessarily if we ever do release the video, you'll see it, but for those listening to the audio, you won't see Cam had the exact same smile on the entire time. It's true. I was like him during the tuck tuck chase, just beaming ear to ear. Yeah. And um, speaking of Beamy, we'll get to Star Trek in a minute, but let's talk about his, his Bond adventure because they moved heaven and earth to get VJ on this film. Yeah, no kidding, right? And you think of the circumstances too. It would have been very easy for them to be like, you know what? We don't want to deal with these complications. We don't even know who our Bond is. Let's focus mm -hmm. on that. But, you know, the fact that they were willing to accommodate his schedule and make all of this work, hey, we all benefited from it, but mm -hmm. it is... It's remarkable on the part of the Broccoli's to be that supportive of, I mean, their entire crew, but obviously him as well. And yeah, I think it was totally for the for the film's benefit. VJ is one of my favorite sort of. We haven't we haven't done a roundtable for for the Moors yet, but we haven't covered any of the films. But when we get to that eventual roundtable and we talk about best you know more allies, I think VJ will be in that conversation. He's really high up. Um, I can't even think of someone else right now who would rival him that much. So yeah. Yeah, and so I'm glad they, they did do that because, you know, I tried to sort of contextualize that in the chat, but you've got to remember, he's shooting this film and then popping to Donetsk to play um, for the US, uh, no, for India, sorry, I should say. And then, you know, he's playing in the Masters all around the world while shooting this film. The guy is, a you know, a fully fledged pro athlete at the same time as, you know, shooting a tuk-tuk chase with Roger Moore. That's a lot to put on his shoulders and... It's only someone that would have the love for Bond that would take on all that responsibility simultaneously. Because I can see a lot of people that like kind of like Bond who were like, oh, I don't want to sacrifice the amount of work I've put into my tennis in this scenario and, and sort of go off for a few weeks. I, I need to focus on that because I want to win at tennis. He loves Bond so much that he was willing to, you know, put double time in basically. Uh, pull double duty to get both this film in and keep his career going on all cylinders. Not only that, he talked about how around the time of the premiere, he got married as well. Mm -hmm. This man's 82 and 83 pretty much uh, defeats my entire lifetime of accomplishments. I mean, holy smokes. Like, I can't imagine what a whirlwind that would have been. Well, you'd have to get a girlfriend first. Well, that would help. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, all time low. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not taking on the world and winning. <laughs> <laughs> you surely are not. Um, but like, I, I, you know, hearing some of those stories about Roger Moore, though, I mean, you just... I think we've, we've said this in one of our other interviews. Maybe it was for Gloria Hendry when we were talking about Live and Let Die. But Roger's not here anymore. Yeah. So we can't have that chat with him. And that, that makes me kind of sad. But we can live vicariously through the people who worked alongside him. And I've yet to meet a person who has said anything bad about the man. And I am thrilled constantly to keep hearing, stacking on these good stories about how generous and warm he is. The fact that he ruined a take so he could walk across the set just to reassure VJ. It just says all you need to know about Roger Moore. Yeah, that's been one of my joys of the podcast is that, you know, obviously we start at one specific point in time running this show mm. where it's too late to talk to some of these people. And you and I have had a lot of fun talking to people about Dean Martin, for example, and getting sure. Dean Martin stories. Yeah. And I've also enjoyed getting these Roger Moore stories, whether it was from um, Gloria Hendry or John Glenn, mm -hmm. or I'm sure other guests will have in the future as well. To just hear VJ talk about, you know, Roger Moore telling a story, diving into a pool, and then like smoking a cigar and finishing the story. Like, that just gives you like a whole picture as to just like what a character Roger Moore was. And obviously someone who... You know, a lot of people that are, you know, quirky characters, 
not necessarily like the most wonderful of human beings when you actually hear the you know the full story, but it really does seem like Roger Moore was a very warm presence that people have nothing but good things to say about. Yeah, and I, I mean, I'm not hunting for a bad story. <laughs> You better not uh, be, Scott. This is I, the wrong podcast. I, I'm not. It's not. We're a, we're a pro more podcast as far as it goes. If we had to, uh, you know, show our allegiance, it's to the eyebrow razor himself. Um, but yeah, just hearing about that and, and how reassuring he was, and I think the other thing that really jumped out to me about the sort of Bond side of the discussion, because yeah, we are celebrating the 41st anniversary of Octopussy, is just how successful VJ is in this film with no training whatsoever. Yeah. Uh, you, you've got to tip your hat to him or, or tip your racket, maybe, if you'd prefer. Um, just to how much he put into it. I mean, we talked about the uh, time he put into it, but the fact that he managed to pull it off, which is, of course, also a testament to John Glenn, to Roger Moore, to Desmond Llewellyn, to the stunt teams, everyone that worked around him to make Octopussy happen. But some of that is VJ too. And he has put that work in and given us a character that will stand the test of time. And I think that means a lot to not only us as Bond fans, but clearly listening to VJ, a lot to him. Well, it was really interesting to hear him talk about how his athletic background kind of worked well with the world of movies. Mm -hmm. With, you know, the confidence, the focus, these various elements that really informed the performance. Because that shines through. It's someone who is used to high intensity high stakes moments in their career right these tennis matches that as he said it's a all or nothing moment you either mm -hmm. win or that's that it all happens in that moment and so to carry that onto a movie set there would be a confidence there that he would have just been trained to have at that point in his career that i think really aids the character because yeah we've seen many of bond movies where they bring in someone who is either a um an untested actor mm -hmm. or b Someone who's kind of a questionable fit for sure. the franchise. And you can see that they struggle. And that's not the case with VJ. And, and you know, I also think of, um, not naming any names, but some people might, maybe not so much in the 80s, but might see themselves as above being in a Bond film. Maybe that was a thing in the 80s, I don't know. Mm. And I think VJ's love of the brand meant he was just game. Set and match. No, he was just <laughs> game. Yeah. For doing anything, because you could say, "Oh, it, it, why am I playing this, uh, you know, flute to the snake when I'm a I work for the MI6? Like, why why am I doing that? Like, it, you could just be that guy if you wanted to, but that's not the point of the film. That's not the tone of the film. The film is tongue in cheek, and VJ got on board with it 100 percent and committed, and I just love him for it. Well, it's also that infectious joy because he talks yeah. about watching Doctor No as a kid and discovering the world of Bond, and that also applies to working on Star Trek Four. It's these things that you love as a kid, getting that experience of actually living in that world for however short a time, and mm. how much that can mean, and how much kind of joy you can bring to that experience. And I suppose then pivoting on to Star Trek as you you brought it up, it's always been something that's connected us. You all know, listening over the years, that's. I think the the first love that Cam and I shared, um, and then now we just have a genuine love for each other as uh, as as men do. Of course, <laughs> we're taking uh, on the world and winning. <laughs> we are, yes, we are. We're at an all time high together. Um, but yeah, it, it's it's such a fleeting role in Star Trek Four. You know, it's almost a blink and you miss it. I think he has two to three talking head scenes. Mm -hmm. But you know, he spoke about going in and putting on that captain's uniform i challenge anyone listening who is a star trek fan to not have had that fantasy at some point i've just been like i'm gonna go and be on the enterprise and wear that captain's uniform you all want to do it everyone wants to do it and hell you could apply that to james bond you all want to wear the tuxedo and go on a mission to the bahamas with domino and fiona volpe you all want to do it and it's okay because that's great and that's this is the sort of thing that we can do through films but he got to do it he got to sit on the bridge of the Enterprise set, it's the USS Yorktown for him, and be the captain, Captain Randolph, for those talking head scenes. Who can say they did that? Very few people. Oh, 100%. And I love the insight into Leonard Nimoy as a director, because, uh, you know, I don't think we're going to be tackling a Leonard Nimoy directorial film at any point nope. on Spy Hard, so we might on the uh, Patreon feed, who knows. But to me, like, that's always interesting, is to, because we all know about Leonard Nimoy, the actor, Mm. He's a very celebrated figure. But to hear that kind of insight into how he helped VJ find the focus 
to shoot those scenes, I think was really interesting. And it was a key bit of direction. Mm -hmm. You know, you are the captain, act like the captain. And I, I imagine that snapped him too. Yeah. Uh, and I, I'm sure the scenes didn't take long to shoot. Um, you know, we did talk to VJ briefly off air about what that potential role would have been on the bridge. There was some talk of it maybe being a, another member of the bridge crew. I'm not sure how that would have applied to Star Trek Four. We'll leave that to the Star Trek historians to figure out. That's right. But uh, Cam, it's been an absolute joy talking about Octopussy celebrating its 41st birthday with Mr. VJ Ambitrage himself. I've had a blast. What about you? Oh, this was a joy. I don't know how we top this with future anniversaries. Uh, maybe we should start doing more anniversaries and, and having interviews that tie into uh, anniversaries. It's maybe uh, maybe that's the thing we can keep doing. Let us know if you enjoyed it, folks. And if this is your first time stopping by on Spy Hards and you've made it this far into the episode, we'd urge you to hit the subscribe button and check out our massive back catalogue of uh, Bond interviews going all the way back to the Connery era. We've had all sorts on the show. I mentioned, you know, Luciana Paluzzi, Fiona Volpe earlier. We've had... Um, Denise Richards, of course, Dr. Christmas Jones, people from basically every single Bond era have been on the show one way or another on our Spy Master interview series. We're getting close to 100 now, crawling ever so slowly to the 100th interview. I wonder what we'll do for that. But yeah, I'd urge you to check out the back catalogue and make sure you hit the subscribe button. But Cam, the question goes to you, sir. I'll fire the torpedo your way. What are we talking about next week? Yes, I think I think this is a first for us. Correct me if I'm wrong. But we are going to look at a video game adaptation. Oh. We are going to look at the 2007 Timothy Oliphant vehicle, Hitman, based on the uh, hit video game. Uh, so this should be really interesting. Uh, Olga Kurilenko, who, of course, was in Quantum of Solace, is the co-star of this film. So there's some, mm -hmm. you know, kind of Bond crossover there. Um, it's been a long time for me, so I'm curious to revisit this one. I've got some history with the video games. I've played a couple of the Hitman video games over the years, but I never watched the films, so I'm keen to see what they do with it. But it's not a video game series that I hold near and dear to my heart, so I'm not particularly prissy about how they deal with the uh, the subject matter. Right. I'm going to go into it with open arms. And this is interesting as well, because you know some people might not think this is immediately a spy series, and you could be right, but... It does have some connections to espionage, and the games certainly do as well, and sort of the tactics you use and things like that. But it's also interesting how many times we've had messages on social media and through emails mentioning the Hitman films and when are we going to take a look at them. There's clearly people who want to hear us talk about it, so I'm keen to finally take a look at Hitman. Yeah, and we will do the second one as well. We will tackle this as a franchise. For sure. So, your mission, folks, should you choose to accept it, is to tune in next week as we take a look at 2007's Hitman. Uh, we mentioned the Patreon earlier. If you want to help the show, if you want to show your love for your favorite spy movie podcast, please join us over on our Patreon, patreon.com slash spyhards. There'll be a link in the show notes below. Every little penny helps. They keep squeezing us with different fees of all of our services. So uh, it's basically just about keeping the roof on at the moment over there. So anything that you can do will definitely help. And uh, make sure you follow us discreetly, as always, on social media. Uh, we're at SpyHards. That's S-P-Y-H-A-R-D-S on Facebook, Instagram, X, TikTok. You can basically find us absolutely anywhere. But until next week, you'll find Cam and I improving our backhand. Mm -hmm.